Welcome to the Cambridge Learning Center and thanks for joining us for this segment of our video newsletter. I'm Leonardo Radamile. Now in this segment of our newsletter we're going to be discussing grammar. Now grammar is something that you probably haven't paid much attention to since middle school or high school, but grammar is absolutely crucial for getting a score of 10 or better on the MCAT verbal section. Now, why is grammar so important? Well, grammar is the language of verbal reasoning, just like math is the language of physics. Most of you have taken physics, and you realize that if you're going to do physics at a higher level, you really need to know math. Math is the language in which physical concepts are contained, understood, and communicated to others. It's really crucial in understanding how physics works. Similarly, Grammar is the language of verbal reasoning. It's the way we understand ideas, key sentences, particularly those long sentences that go on for five or six lines and may contain 50 or 60 words. Grammar allows you to take that large wall of words and reduce it to two or three key words that gives you the concept of what the author is saying. Now, grammar is made up of two parts, parts of speech and parts of a sentence. Parts of speech are the definitions and functions of individual words. It's the jobs that words do and their nature. Parts of a sentence deal with groups of words and how words relate to each other. So let's take a look at some examples. And after we do, we're going to take a look at a passage from an MCAT verbal to show you how important these concepts are and how they can quickly improve your performance. Now for our first example of parts of speech, we're going to be looking at nouns. What is a noun? A noun is the name of a person, place, thing, or idea. Let's take a look at some. Here we have Mary. Mary is the name of a person. And here we have home. Home is the name of a place. Then we have car, it's the name of a thing. And history is the name of idea. So we see nouns as the names of persons, places, things, or ideas. Another category of words is verbs. Verbs are either action words or description words. For example, Mary walks to school. Walks tells us the action that Mary takes. Mary seems happy. Seems describes what Mary is. So that gives you an idea of what parts of speech are. Figuring out what an individual word is, what type of word it is, and to do this, you just have to memorize some definitions. Now, parts of a sentence are a little bit different. These involve seeing how words are grouped together. Let's take a look at two different groups of words, a sentence and a dependent clause. Now, a sentence is a group of words with a noun and a verb that can stand by itself as an independent idea. You already know what a noun and a verb are, so this should be pretty easy. Mary went home. Notice, we have a noun, Mary, and a verb, went. And those words can stand by themselves as an independent idea. So that's what a sentence is. Now let's take a look at what a clause is. A clause is a group of words with a noun and a verb that is part of a sentence. It doesn't stand alone by itself. For example, after Mary went home, Mary went to bed. Now, in this sentence, we have two clauses. After Mary went home and Mary went to bed. Each has a subject and a verb, but they're very different. Now, notice that Mary went to bed here is not a sentence because it's not standing by itself. It's part of a sentence. But if you took it out of the sentence, it could stand alone. We call this an independent clause. But compare that to after Mary went home. It couldn't stand by itself. If you just said after Mary went home, you'd be waiting for someone to say something else. Okay, what happened after she went home? We call these independent and dependent clauses. One is independent and can stand by itself if you take it out of the sentence. Mary went home. The other depends on the independent clause to make it any sense. After Mary went home. 
Now, knowing these kinds of distinctions is very important for the MCAT test. So let's take a look at a passage from the Exam Crackers 101 Passages in MCAT Verbal and see how this works. Now, when you read this, please take your time and see if you can pick out the main ideas. You might even want to write them down. So why don't you stop the video now and read the passage carefully. Now, most students, when they see a passage like this, will go through it painstakingly, trying to figure out what it is saying and remember as many facts as possible. This is both a slow and very confusing process. Cognition, or understanding, is based on seeing clearly the key idea and how the different parts of the sentence relate to each other, not trying to remember facts. And grammar allows you to do just that. Let's take a look at this paragraph together using a grammatical analysis. Now, we know from rhetoric that we discussed in our last newsletter that the topic sentence, the first sentence here, is critically important. It has a lot of information in it and is very long. It's over 50 words. So how do we extract what's really important? The rules of grammar tell us to look at the main clause first. That part of the sentence having a subject and a verb which, if you could take it out of the sentence, could stand by itself. The second rule that we would apply here is to strip away from any modifiers, like adjectives and adverbs, that are not critical to the meaning of the sentence. This would leave us with, it provides a survey of hospitality. Now, notice that we've reduced a jumble of over 50 words to a clear core idea about the Odyssey. This is the key point the author is making. It, the Odyssey, provides a survey of hospitality. If we apply the same type of analysis to the conclusion sentence, which we know is significant from our discussion of rhetoric, we can reduce it to, to harm a guest was considered a sin. Now, notice what we've done. We've extracted the two key ideas in clear language now, this is not to say that you're going to ignore whatever else is in the paragraph or that the other language is irrelevant. What you are going to do is focus on or emphasize these two ideas. Now, notice what happens when you do that. Everything else makes sense. You have a cognitive framework that organizes all that language for you and makes it clear and comprehensible. You can then see how the second sentence and the rest of the language relates to those two key ideas. You see, a grammatical analysis allows you to, in effect, take an x-ray of a sentence, especially a particularly long sentence. It allows you to see the underlying structure of that sentence and see what's really important and what's not so important. It allows you to see clearly what the argument of the author is, where he's going with his ideas, and what they really mean. We know from cognitive psychology that the more clearly you see the idea, the more deeply you'll understand it. And not only that, but when your understanding improves, your speed will improve. And not only will your speed improve, but you'll also retain information a lot better. So that when you go to the questions and answers, you're going to remember a lot more from the text. And if there's something that you don't remember, you can go back to the key sentences and quickly isolate exactly where that information is. Now, all of this may seem like a lot of work, and it is. But just like you mastered organic chemistry, you can master this. It's just a question of learning the basic concepts and then understanding the relationships between them. You know, probably the best analogy you can make to this is in athletics. Now, think about if you wanted to learn how to play tennis. And let's just take one part of that. Well, if you're going to learn tennis, the first thing you're going to have to do is learn how to serve a ball. And serving a ball is made up of a lot of discrete parts. Well, the first thing you have to learn is putting your left foot in front of your right foot and in the event that you're right-handed. You're then going to have to look up and throw the ball up into the air. And as you do so, take the racket back behind you and then swing it over your head in an upward arc. And as you do so, watch the ball and then watch where it goes while at the same time rotating your hips 
and putting all of your body power into that movement. You're then going to have to move your foot back and get ready to move to wherever on the court the opposition has served the ball back to you. Now, those are a lot of steps, but after a period of time, after you practice them, after you remember them, and after you master them, they become a reflex. You do them automatically. The same holds true in grammar and in verbal reasoning. What will happen is, in the beginning, you're going to memorize a bunch of definitions, and there really aren't that many. After you've memorized them, what you're going to do is apply them to the text. And as you apply them more and more, they will become natural to you. They'll become like a reflex action, and you'll be able to do them quickly and efficiently. You'll even get to the point where you won't even have to think about it where you could look at a very long sentence like the ones that we looked at today and just automatically go to the main concept. Think of it this way. What we're actually doing is installing a new operating system in your frontal cortex. We're putting in a new set of logarithms the way you analyze language. And what happens after a while, instead of just having to worry about writing the logarithms, understanding them, they work by default. The same thing happens in verbal reasoning. So with our last video and this video, you can see how rhetoric allows you to pick out the key ideas, the key sentences, and then grammar allows you to get into those sentences and really find out what they mean with clarity and efficiency. Now in our next video newsletter, we're going to be dealing with the relationship of ideas. Once you've picked out the key sentences and analyzed them accurately, seeing how the ideas relate to each other. This is particularly important for those questions where they ask you, what does the author imply? What does he suggest? What can you infer? Seeing that relationship of ideas will really give you the answer to all of these questions. So thanks again for joining us for this segment of our video newsletter, and thanks for stopping by at the Cambridge Learning Center. You're always welcome. Tell your friends, and for the Cambridge Learning Center, I'm Leonardo Radamile.